Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest is one of the stars of the absolute craziest, most insane show on TV, Happy. In it, Lilian Morajnik plays homicide detective Meredith McCarthy, someone trying to solve what the hell is happening in this extremely gruesome, extremely surreal and hilarious world. Let's take a look. Jesus Christ, Nick! Here, what are you doing here? Uh, you need to calm down. Oh, oh, I can never unsee it. Calm down, Nick. This is my job. Are you stalking me? Oh, great. Her again. What? No. I didn't call it that. I was at the mud shelter. I looked down. Who do I see? Mary McCarthy, realtor. I must have been sitting on your face for 10 minutes. All right, that's it. Out of the tub. It was you. The squatter in the condo on North 6th. I should have recognized that smell. That was a nice place. A little transitional for my taste, but very nice. Oh, Jesus. Oh, it's not like something you haven't seen before. Don't remind me. Please promise me you will destroy this thing by fire before contamination spreads. Oh, there it is. Damn it, Sax, this is not OK. Now, you can't screw this up for me. I got Haley a couple days a month. I, mean, I just need a place where she can sleep in a nice bed. Just clean. You know, someplace normal. How's a guy like me supposed to afford a place like that? Your problem was never making money. It was drinking it and snorting it. Yeah, well, you're looking at the new Nick Sachs. I'm clean. Ish. Everybody, please welcome Lily Mirajnik. Let's hear it. Hey. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, congratulations on getting the second season of this show. Not because the first season wasn't great, but because it's completely <laughs> batshit crazy. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard to believe that there is like space for something this wild. Yeah, Thank God sci-fi did it. Somebody was on drugs or something when they decided to Right, you think up. that the executive was just like, <laughs> uh, <let's laughs> All right. Uh, did you think while you were up to all of the antics of the first season that you would get a second season? Did it feel like you would? Yeah. Really? I don't know why. I think it's just the absurdity of it. And also, we wrapped up the graphic novel in season one, so it's kind of like, what could we do when we're let loose of the book? So, I mean, I'd be curious to see what it would be, so. I mean, doing some crazy stuff from what I've seen. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I can't really get, I don't want to give anything away, but it's pretty fucked up. Well, you know, within the first, what, five minutes of the first episode, you see how fucked up we're getting. And because <laughs> we've never blown it all right in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, so if that's the opening, you can only imagine where we might go, you know? And so it's very, uh, we don't, nothing's precious in the happy world. How do you uh, ground yourself as, a, as an actor playing, playing this stuff? Do you have to ground yourself? Or do you heighten your performance uh, to, the, to the, like sort of the, the tone of the world? Mm. I think I'm fortunate because Mary is a really grounded person. Right. So it kind of, lends itself to it and it Chris doesn't Chris has to be like Chris is like I don't have to talk to happy yeah. I don't have to exist in the world where imaginary things happen I just exist in the world and I've seen so many <clears throat> bad things that it's like shit happens just accept it know that you know seen stranger things before and accept it so it's not it's not the hardest thing there is a little bit of a different type of journey Mary goes on this season and she uh, she sees some more shit that maybe she hasn't seen before but like it's the idea of that was where it was interesting for me as the actor to be like how embracing of this does she become and what does it take for her to embrace it and there are some things along the way that you're just kind of like all right I've seen everything, so why wouldn't I believe this? Were you, do you think prior to doing something like Happy, you would be the audience, in the audience for Happy? I think so. Yeah. I will say, because most of my friends, though yes, they're very supportive of me and I love them very much, <laughs> but they're also very much like, I'd watch this show whether you were in it or not. Right. 
and we all kind of have similar tastes. So even though it's hard for me to kind of take a step back and be like, would I like it or would I? I'm too wrapped up in it. Based off of them, I kind of go, yeah, I'd probably. What was the, I'm curious, like how someone, I mean, I know how someone ends up in Happy, but like how you started acting. What was the thing that you saw when you were younger that made you want to act? I don't know exactly what it was. My mom's in the business, and so I grew up kind of on set. So it was more from that perspective where I just saw these people that, like, were giving clothes, and people were doing their makeup, and then they just started playing pretend. Right. And I was like, oh, they're being a doctor, but they're not really a doctor. That's cool. You know, or they're a lawyer, and not really a lawyer. So it wasn't about, like, a particular story or anything. It was about the actual behind the set, behind the scenes, the yeah. actual world itself. Yeah, it was just this... I, circus, as they call it. Yeah, it was just this creative world where, you know, you got to collaborate with people and you got to discuss it all and, and it just continued building from there and seeing the pieces kind of all come together. That. And that's so important, too, because when you do start doing it on your own, you have this prerequisite knowledge of the ups and downs and what it's actually going to be like to be a working actor. Yeah, that's uh, it's given me a very unique perspective because my kind of like my wiring is different because I didn't have to learn those things. That's what I grew up embracing. It's kind of a part of my DNA. I know I understand the politics of it. I understand what goes on behind the scenes and why something might be one way or not the other, even though from the surface, it looks like that one would make sense. But no, it's that way because of a bunch of other inner workings. And I just get that. You mean like you can be on set, like most, a lot of actors will be like, well, why are they telling me to do this? Or why is this thing happening? It has to be because of me, right? Because that's what we all do when something is happening that we don't understand. We go, well, it's obviously just because of me, they hate me. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you can go, no, that's because of the producer or the light or something like that. Exactly. It doesn't, you know, the, the, oh my God, am I terrible? And all that kind of stuff. It doesn't. to be less self-centered and narcissistic. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, less therapy for you. Amazing. Exactly. Don't have to worry about spending the money there. Just, you know, (laughs) stay grounded, turn it into other things. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just understanding what all the people, cause that was also part of growing up around it. It was, I got to learn what a grip did. I got to learn what the art department did and why props and production design and art decoration, they're all different things. And, you know, and finding out all those pieces and how they fit together, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) landing on a mark, finding your light, like all those things, they're things that when you go, I'm going to be an actor, you go into it and you (laughs) go, I get to work. And then you forget that there are other pieces that have nothing to do with acting that you need to know. You also need to know how to talk to them as well. Exactly. And lots of actors go in and are like, why isn't this happening right now? And because they actually don't know that it takes time for the crew to do this. Exactly. So going into that and knowing that and making it a part of my learning experience as opposed to having my education and then having another education. It just all was blended together. You had the same, edu- you were getting educated in school while at the same time getting educated on set? Basically. Did you, were you a, did you start acting as a child? <laughs> I wasn't allowed. Really? Yeah. Good for your parents. Well, she was very supportive, my mom, and, you know, absolutely you can do this, but you're not going to be a child actor and end up on drugs. So <laughs> she was like, you know, there were a couple times where friends of hers were casting something and they would, she would let me go in for it just to kind of, get the feel, and she let me, um, my school had a very strong performing arts department. She was like, go do that. Take classes after school. Do whatever. Go to college and study it. But you're not foregoing school for it. And you're. And there was one when I was a kid that she had let me go in on that I actually got close on. Mm. And they came to her and said, if we wanted her to do this, would you let her? And she said, no. Was it a big part? It was a decently big part. Was it, is it a project that we know about? I mean, some people know it. I feel like it's our generation that really kind of knows it. It was a Disney movie called The Big Green. Okay. And it was a soccer movie about a bunch of, like, ragtag. It was basically, like, Little Giants, but for soccer. Right. Anyways. Or The Bad News Bears, but for soccer. Exactly. Or, like, this movie, but for soccer. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and... I was mad at her for a little while after I found that out. But it's like, I mean, looking back on it now, I'm really Did she tell you right away? 
No, she didn't tell. So she years didn't t- later, we didn't know. I didn't know that I got close. I thought, okay, I went. She let me do this audition, and you know, to understand what it is or whatever, and that was it. You know, she, there were a couple of those throughout my childhood and into my teen years that she let me do, but it was like, here's your taste. Here's your taste. Of the one thing that you haven't gotten to experience, because. Right. Being on set, you're not experienced what an audition room's like. So. When did she tell you? God, I think I was like 18. Wow. And I think I was 11 when I auditioned so for she it. She was like, now's the t- it's your 18th birthday. <laughs> yeah, now's basically. Now's the time to tell you. Surprise. I ruined your child acting exactly. career. <laughs> Um, so yeah, but she, so, and then I went and I studied in college. I went to an acting conservatory and it was in high school that I f- realized that I loved theater. And so I was like, screw this film and television stuff. I want to go do that. And so I went and kind of had a focus on that and then became an equal opportunity employer. What <laughs> was it? Any what, of it. What's your favorite uh, role in the theater that you've done? That I've done? Yeah. Uh, pro- <laughs> probably there was this, there's a play called Dear Brutus that was written by J.M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan. Um, obviously a lesser known work. People are just really familiar with Peter Pan and it's a really cool play. It takes place in three acts and it's like uh, Puck from Midsummer Night Dream. That type of character hosts like a dinner party on a Midsummer Night and he's kind of wily and it's a bunch of couples and they all have their own problem and somewhere in between like dinner or dessert, something like that, they all kind of venture out into the backyard and da 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 and closes act one, act two opens, and it's basically like alternate versions of their life. Mm. And that, like everything that they wanted or has made something wrong in their lives that they've, you know, been bitching about in act one, shows them the other side of their life in act two. And then come to act three, they've experienced that, they're back to reality. And what does that make them want to change? And what does that inspire or not inspire? And there was one couple who doesn't have children and the father wanted children and the mother didn't and so their part in act two is the father with a child that he never got to have I played the child and so there was just something interesting to play an imaginary character (laughs) precursor to have me um and just the life that existed in it and it was I mean I think I was I was like 20 and I was playing a 12 year old but it was fun and it was different. Did you have to look young and act and act like mm-hmm. a child? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that was fun. That was fun, and it also took place in like the late eighteen hundreds. Mm-hmm. So, throwing that into the mix too. If there was a role you could play in the theater, what's your dream role? In the theater? Yeah. Oh. Because in film and television, you don't really re- yeah no I get that. reprise roles as much. Sure. Um, there's a couple. <sighs> Shakespeare wise, it's Iago in. Uh, in Othello, mm-hmm. uh, in musical, the MC in Cabaret, and it, there's a one act called No Exit, Jean Paul Sartre, mm-hmm. and there's a character named Inez, and that's always been at the top of my list. Mm. Why, how did you come across No Exit? Uh, a lot of our reading is senior year in high school was existentialism. Right. And so. Such a weird thing that they I give seniors know. in high school, right? Like, here, go and bark on your journey of life like, and just be all deep and fucked up about it. Like, you're six, you're 17 years old. You're already like the darkest you're probably going to be <laughs> in your life because you're just wrapped up in hormones and emotions. And you think all your personal drama is the end of the world. And you get all this literature that is like, life is meaningless. It is the end of the world, <laughs> exactly. for basically. Go ahead and try, try to have like a good, a good time at college. Go off. No wonder everybody goes to college and just parties super hard yeah, for like the first they're year. like, just live drunk. Yeah. Because then it won't matter. It doesn't matter. Exactly. Yeah. yeah um, so. What is the craziest thing you've had to do unhappy so far? Well, you saw part of it. Oh. Um, Look down. at Maloney's butt. But it's not just butt in that shot. Because I've seen the butt. Was it the full? The It was the full Monty in every way, shape, or form. When you have the type of body he does, so when he needs to like squat down, he can't really do that with closed legs. So he's kind of in a wide position and bending over. 
So when you're so you directly behind and you have to look over, you kind of get an eyeful. That reaction, that's real. You've seen Chris Maloney's bum hole. Yes. Wow. Yeah. How do you guys handle that conversation on Saturday? Do you have do you have intimacy coordinators like 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 the Deuce does? Not in the same way. Um, Chris, are you we, comfortable with Lily seeing your asshole today? Okay, <laughs> great, Lily. That is, well, that's like, part of the thing. I need more of like a hand holder than he does. He's like, it's my ass. It's its own entity. Enjoy it. Use it as you need to. Me, it's like we know what it is. I had a bit of that in season one. There's, uh, I think it's like episode seven. He basically gets a dildo stuck in his ass. Um, and I have to be back there like, ooh, how do I get it out? I love our show. Um, <laughs> welcome to Happy. Uh, and he, um, so we had that eyeline that had, obviously there was no dildo in there. So that was my eyeline. So oh, I, I'm sorry. Wait, he didn't actually have the dildo in his ass? I know. Magic of movie making. I thought Maloney was a method actor. I'm <laughs> disappointed. You should yell at him. Next time he's here. Mm-hmm. I heard you didn't actually put the dildo in your ass, Chris. Yeah, I know. He's kind of a pussy like that. Um, but, no, he... Or not. Or not. I mean, but he should go for stuff like that. Wouldn't you want it? Like, what else you... That's the whole thing about acting. Get different experiences than you, you would in You get to do life. a bunch of stuff that you... I mean... But if you wanted that experience, you could yeah, have... Yeah, I'm sure you could have like, it in a different setting. It's not like setting. becoming a scientist <laughs> or a, something. There's a much more intimate setting yeah. you can try that out in. Um, he, yeah, so, like, we had that to deal with last year. And so we've already kind of stuck our feet in. This year, but last year, based off of our shot, I was able to kind of cheat it. And I kind of just had to stare at the top of his ass and his back. This year I tried to cheat it again, and um, I got yelled at by, by Brian him? Taylor. Oh, by Brian Taylor. Who said, Lil, I can tell you're not looking at it. I need you to look at it. And I was like, I don't want to look at it. And so I had to, and we what got Chris it, thank God. What did Chris say in situation? <laughs> he was just like, stop. Just breathe. You're an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guy. But what was so funny about it is because it was the first setup of that scene. So I'm the only one with that angle. And, you know, all of the equipment and everybody's on the other side of Chris. And so finally, when we had to shoot the other side, everybody else got what I saw. So I was like, see, do you understand why I was trying not to look at it? So everybody's kind of in it together. Also, poor Chris, in a way, I mean, his his butthole is just showing for this entire, what, half day? No, we shot it pretty quick. I'll definitely give that. That's that whole thing probably was like turning it around. Both turnarounds from both sides. I'd say we maybe had like seven takes total. Thank God no one shoots on film anymore. And it wasn't like, I know. Check, check the gate. Oh, we had a hair in the lens, Chris. Sorry. Take it off. Take it off. Let's go. Our show's terrifying sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's always pretty. I do wind up in a very big um, suit this season. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of like something you would see at, you know, does it, like a full character suit. That was fun and interesting. And everyone was like, sure you don't want like stunt person in it? Because I'm shorter than the normal person who wears it. And I was like, no, it's cool, it's cool. And I could see through it. And they were like, maybe we need to like take care. And I was like, I will show you that I can do it. Give me the damn suit. And so I made them put me in it and I proved it to them by being able to pick the head of it mm. on and off whilst in the suit and so but that was not, I never thought I was going to wind up in a um, costume like that you know I had friends who worked at Disneyland who grew up in or Disney World who grew up in uh, Florida um, but I never had that opportunity it was like when am I ever going to be well, in you're a character? an actor you get to experience all these different exactly. lifestyles he yeah. gets the dildo in the butt you get the mascot out exactly then. it's a ton of fun it's a great trade off it is but it's a lot of, like, I mean, these are the things I got to do this season. I got to stare at Maloney's asshole, uh, got to go in a mascot costume, um, I do got wanna, to kill a bunch of Nazis. I would like to make a super cut of uh, this interview and us saying Maloney's asshole, Chris's asshole, <laughs> Chris's butthole, bumhole. This is, this is and literally cut it been together everything. And send it to him. <laughs> he'd be like, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I don't think he'd care. I don't think he he'd does. care at all. 
Uh, I think we have time for a couple questions uh, from the audience. Hi. Hi. Uh, do you have any habits or special rituals that you do in your dressing room or trailer that you've learned over the years helps your performance? It kind of depends on what I'm working on. Happy, just kind of like center in to the fact that I'm going to work because I love everybody that's around, so I kind of fall into just having fun as Lily around them. So I just kind of zone in. But like, there, it's really dependent upon what what the job is, what the day looks like. You know, it's um, we get a lot of if it's something a bit heavier, like I do, I need a little bit of quiet time. I need to listen to some music and kind of like center myself into where I need to be for the day. But there's no in particular routine or ritual. Just nice big breakfast. That's about it, yeah. Uh, next question, our, I think our last one, yeah. Right here. Hi there. Hi. Hi. This is a question from our site. Yeah. Um, was there any scene from the comic that didn't make it into the show that you wish did? Any scene from the comic? I don't think so. We were pretty true because we had more time to fill than we had content from the comic. So I think for the most, oh, you know what? I know what there was. There was a scene on a train where Mary was looking for Sax and Smoothie was looking for Mary. And it kind of all caught up to each other and it was all like on something that would be kind of like a Metro North or a Long Island Railroad type of thing. And I always thought that would have been a good, cool sequence that we never got to use in our storyline. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Lily, this has been fun. You too. It's been Thanks. fun talking about Chris's asshole. <laughs> the story of my life. Uh, the show, uh, se season two of Happy premieres tonight. Tonight. On Sci-Fi. Mm -hmm. And the premiere is... Totally insane. Mm -hmm. Everybody should watch it. Uh, and give a huge round of applause for Lily Mirage and Nick Latera.